Is this working? Yes, it's on. You see these notes, I'm testing myself for later. Normally, you'll never see me do a talk with notes, but I'm revealing something brand new to you today. So I've got my notes I need to refer to for key messaging later. However, I want to give you some background and talk about the background that Herb just mentioned. So I started off in the 80s in this school here, an all-girls school, who were more interested in teaching us about needlework and classical studies and then they were about careers. In actual fact, they were more interested about how many panels we had in our A-line bottle green skirts than talking about what our futures were. And they expected us to perhaps go into law or, or be a professor or be a doctor or, or a vet. And we never really had the opportunity to explore what we wanted to do. So in the 80s, these came out. The Amstrad CPC 464, how many of you remember this? What sort of age groups am I looking at? <laughs> OK, a handful. So for those who don't know, this was a console, which we saw as computers. And my grandparents bought me this with a green screen monitor because I was meant to work on it. So I learned how to write address books in basic. And then I learned how to play gauntlet and press red buttons in different shades of green because that's what I really wanted to do. And a boy had introduced me to these, and they opened up my eyes to what was possible in technology. However, my school didn't show us how to use computers and weren't interested in how we use them at all. But then what happened was at 18, I went off to college. School had let me down. They told me I'd never do anything in computers or maths and don't think about it. So I went to college and went into humanities. But at 18, the relationship with my grandparents, who I'd been living with, broke down. And I ended up homeless. This is a, a representation, a very poor artist representation, of my car sitting on seafront in Kent that I lived in. And let's set the scene. It was, it was early 90s, so it was a lot safer than it is today. I didn't receive any hassle. And I put clothes up around the, the windows of the car to give me some privacy. And my friends, I was very fortunate, my friends would take me home to theirs to let me shower. I think they were hinting that I might smell. And they brought me food. We just had a McDonald's installation in the town, so quarter pounders with cheese were, were a once a week treat that my friends would bring. But what I did is I needed to find a job. So I walked to the job centre every day. My car had no petrol, I couldn't afford it. And I said to them, can you help me find a job? And they let me use their computers, and I wrote my CV on their computers with their help. And I must have posted 100 with the stamps that they gave me. And then one day, an organization said, come in for an interview. And it was great. And I borrowed this wonderful black suit from my friend, little page boy haircut, very different to today in my glasses, and walked in. And they gave me the job. They took a chance on this girl who had no experience. I had no experience whatsoever. I just had GCSEs. And they gave me that job at 18 and, and took a punt on me, basically. So then what happened was, in the 90s, I then moved on to an organisation called Eurostar. And whilst I was there, these wonderful solutions came out. So Netscape Navigator Gold, which had a WYSIWYG editor in HTML. And I taught myself how to create web pages in HTML. I sat at home doing this. Actual fact, I was, I was writing some of these web pages while the first Big Brother came out in the late 90s as well, sitting at home, watching Nasty Nick and, and writing in front page, which was an awful solution to actually write web pages in, but it taught me how to do it, and using Demon Internet. So we had the whole dial-up connections, it was very slow. But while I was there, what happened was, Eurostar said, why don't you come and work for us in our IT team? You're quite tech-savvy, right? You work on our ticket desk, but there's something about you. And they took a chance and gave me a role testing European reservation systems integrated with British rail systems. And I loved it. It was my first forage into IT and technical. And from that, I got a full-time role. I moved up from Watford to Watford from Kent. And I got a, a, a role testing electronic parts catalogs. It's not very exciting. But actually, they put me in the US. And I lived out in the US for a while doing this. So it was, it was quite exciting for a mid-20-something. So I'd taken these roles, and then I wanted to step up, and I took a, a role in London as a QA manager. It's my first managerial role. This was in 2000. So that's a whistle-stop whistle -stop tour up to 2000, and I want to tell you what happened from there and how I came north. So I was the project manager, QA manager, and a scripting manager, a development manager, for what was a 40-person company 
back in 2002 called Money Supermarket, who most people will know. I was the QA manager, the project manager, and the scripting manager who released the first ever comparison engine in the world. Now, we knew it was revolutionary, but we didn't actually know what we were doing. In fact, we called it product aggregation. And now we know it's comparison engines. That's a really boring title. So we delivered home insurance, and everybody probably knows the story of Money Supermarket after that. We grew to 300 people in the three years that I was there. So once I left there, I did a stint consulting across Europe for tilling systems when Chip and Pin came out in 2005 and testing to make sure that you can go in and you can buy your products and use Chip and Pin on the new cards. And then I was offered a role at an organization that Herb mentioned, which was very, very different for me. It was known as digital. From that point on, it had been IT, and now I was moving into what is now known as digital. And I started working for Amaze. Amaze were once again a small agency. We were in this awful office in Runcorn that they moved from Liverpool to for a short while. And I was brought in to set up all their support and their managed services and their teams there for that. And I did for 12 years. And while I was there, I, I managed to work with some huge clients and listen to what they were saying and what they needed from organizations like the one I was working for. And listening to their pain points and, and listening to them to say, you know, this is what we're struggling with and what nobody's delivering for us. So off the back of it, I managed to create some innovative services that people could use in global organizations. And in fact, one of the services led to me winning an award in 2016 in how we can use data to show how people are managing websites and detect their human behavioral change and the impact it's having on the users. So looking at the management and um, how you view the site and not looking at the design elements, but actually the people running it. And that won awards and, and that, that um, knowledge has stayed with me and, and we carry on doing that as well. So then what happened was, I started having a thought about the way that agencies need to change. I was seeing a real difference in, in the way that clients were interacting with agencies. I was talking to other agency owners in the city, nationwide, and what we were seeing was that the big um, design and build projects, as we call them, the replatforming projects, were just not coming through. And people were being asked to look at what they had already and use it. They'd already done big replatforms twice, and they couldn't use it six months on. They weren't going to do it again. So I started thinking about this, and I went on holiday to California, my first holiday in 25 years. But that's another story, not for today. <laughs> And I really contemplated, what did I need to do to fill this gap? There was clearly a gap out there. And I got back from holiday, and in October, Gartner released this report. So my intuition, my feelings about what was happening and what I was talking about became confirmed in a tangible way from a survey that Gartner had, had put out through their chief marketing officers, that they were being asked to really look at what they were spending and to, to look at what they had already and look at the, the investment that they'd already made in that. So as a result, I thought, I need to do something. I need to go alone. However, for any of you who's ever started out a business on your own from something else, it's really hard. And I was like, how am I actually going to achieve this? I've never set up business on my own. There's a whole load of things. How do I actually do this? And I started thinking about it more and more and more. So what I did, I just quit my job. And that pushed me to actually think about how I do this on my own, because I've just quit. I have no income after a few months. How do I do this? So I had to find out. And actually, I was really lucky. Along the way, I've been very fortunate in things, um, a collision of timings, where two other people had also quit their jobs, and they were pursuing other things. And they decided to come and join me. So I have... Joe and Zoe, who are my technical and operations director, who joined me. And they were looking for other jobs, I'll be honest, and they had other interests they were pursuing, but I managed to persuade them this was what we could do and what we could achieve, and we would be completely unique in the industry. So they joined me, and we got an office at Spaces in the tea factory in Wood Street, who welcomed us and was a very good fit for us. And lo and behold, Think Live was born on the 1st of March. And this is the first public opening and, and talk around Think Live. So we were very fortunate in that when I was looking for investment, I was looking at how I do this. 
I approached an agency to try and back us, and they backed my wild radical plans. Imagine an organisation that only works on things that are live. We're not going to do big design and build projects. We're not going to build you something new. We're going to take what you've got and we're going to make it better and make it work for you and also empower your staff to make sure that they're enabled to, to look after it. But they backed us. So we're part of Think, which is a, once again a northern agency who came out of Newcastle and have a, a London presence as well. And they said, you know what, we'll fund you and we'll back you and you can become a practice within our organisation. So we were really fortunate. But when there was a time in the market where marketing budgets are really, really stalled and people are being asked to make most of what they've got, what we're trying to do is take an approach that others will follow, where you don't have to do things new from scratch, that actually take what you've got and build on it and make it right and make it work and also empower your staff to be able to look after it yourselves so you're not relying on other people to do that. And your website and your site should be able to do those things. And actually, we're trying to make them future-proofed. So you don't have to go and spend millions on a global site to just to do that. So we've got four key areas that we've looked at. So we look at rejuvenating, as it says on the tin, what is there already. So we're not looking to replace it. We're looking to, to make sure that it works. Rolling out globally, so if you're growing, we can um, look at how you do that, enabling staff and also sustaining so you can keep it running, keep that light on, and keep that green light on constantly. But what we also thought was, how do we get the talent? I'm also chair of Young Talent at the British Interactive Media Association. So I see the problems that we have nationwide on talent, and, and in Liverpool we do. Now, what I could think about was nearshoring, offshoring to grow the talent that I need to run this business. However, I've still got to train them, so why not invest in our young people? Our young people today are coming out of school, they're coming out of university, and they need opportunities. And we have some great organisations here, the Studio School, Innovators Hub, O, as it's now called, Agent Academy, and Innovate Her, who are priming these youngsters to come into our industry. Let's give them a chance. And in actual fact, I hope he's in the audience, we started with one young person who joined us only last week. Um, who was working as a labourer and is now working in setting up business solutions with us and training how to do that. And we're going to grow a, a, a lot of young people and developers who we will come in and train in solutions and then with the view that we will plan for them to leave. We know that people move around, so in two years they'll move on, hopefully to some of your organisations where we've trained them already, and some will move up into technical lead positions and will underpin and promote from within and hopefully help grow those young people and grow that talent that can come out into the other organisations in Liverpool and not leave Liverpool for other jobs. So I want to say a big thank you to you for listening, but also to all those who've supported Think Live at the LEP, Herb and the team here in our launch, and, and may we thank you for your ongoing support in the future. Thank you. <laughs> and no notes. First of all, great talk. Um, uh, really interesting. Uh, just a really quick question, a practical one. So you're obviously attached to an existing, uh, you know, very successful, large digital agency. Obviously, you previously were working for another one. What, what's going to be the main thing that distinguishes Think Live from Amaze or, or Think Regular, if you will? Well, actually, I was really, really pleased to go to Think because they're a transformation agency. Mm -hmm. And um, what's going to really distinguish us is that transformation, is about enabling the people to look after it. So you don't have to keep coming back to us. We're going to make sure your staff have the, the means to be able to maintain and sustain you go ongoing. So you can bring it in-house right. or give you the capability if you don't have that. Okay. So it's that ongoing rather than deliver and walk away. Yep. We're going to make sure that you can carry on. So it's, it sounds like it's partially almost about helping change the client and their behavior and how they operate versus Absolutely. here's a website or an app or whatever it might be. Absolutely. And, and some of the data that we've shown, we've shown um, where people, for example, have become disengaged with their jobs through some of the data and patterns that we've seen. Mm -hmm. So that three months before somebody left their job, we started seeing a change in how they were managing and how they were running the website. 
And so you could put correctional measures in place and make sure that's, that member of staff's happy and they're trained wow. so that they continue. Yeah. And that's really powerful, having that insight and yeah. then showing the impact. And we see that those people who are managing correctly with staff who are engaged in the programme and are well-trained, mm -hmm. they have three times the level of conversions that somebody who doesn't has wow. that. And other people have to pay paid media to get people to their site, whereas they have a lot more organic visits just by the people running it, not the design. And that's really important is the human factor. Wow. So it's a, almost a sort of people transformation agency as opposed to a digital one. Absolutely. Yeah. It's all encompassing. Digital is not just infrastructure. It's not just code. It's about okay. the people running it. Amanda, thank you very much. And best of luck with the new venture. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you.